Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the uh, Distinguished Online Lecture Series. And uh, today we have Professor M.D. Nalapar, uh, UNESCO Peace Chair and Honorary Director of Department of Geopolitics and International Relations. It's an honor to have you here, sir. And uh, he has chosen the topic, India in the Era of Cold War 2.0, which is extremely relevant and contemporary. And uh, he would probably speak for next uh, 30 minutes, and then followed by a question answer session with all of you. So we have a lot of students uh, who are online. Uh, we have uh, more than uh, 20 uh, the students who are online, and then we also have research scholars and the master students in the second year here. So without wasting much time and standing between you and personal Alapath, I would request personal Alapath to deliver his lecture. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nanda, for having uh, invited me here to address uh, our students. And I'm, I'm delighted to see this group here. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, Cold War 1.2 was between the United States and the USSR. And what was the genesis of this, of this Cold War? The genesis of that was basically it was a battle of systems. The USSR had a particular system of government. The United States had a particular system of government. And the USSR was very clear that they do not believe the US system of government is ideal for the people or for the world. And they would like to see it replaced by the Soviet system of, uh, of government wherever possible. So obviously, that again is a zero-sum situation. Let's say you have a country following one system, and it follows the, the Soviet system, goes to the Soviet system. Ev evidently, the United States loses, Russia gains. You have, I mean, uh, USSR, Soviet Union gains. You have a system that is following the Soviet model. It goes to the American model. Well, uh, the Soviets lose, the Americans uh, gain. So it's a zero-sum situation. When you have a zero-sum situation, you have a Cold War you have uh, the basis for a Cold War. When you're looking at things in a zero-sum way, that is the foundation of a Cold War, especially when you're looking at a systemic competition between superpowers. At that point in time, the USSR was very definitely a superpower. Uh, and so that is exactly the root of Cold War 1.0. Now, in any situation, you have individuals who would like to basically say that nothing is wrong, you know, and things are going normally, that there should be no Cold War, or there should be some kind of a agreement, or whatever it is, and all these uh, strands are there. But fundamentally, the problem is, when you have a power that decides a system is good, and that system needs to be adopted across the world, which is the United States, and you have a revisionist power which says, no, your system is bad, it's better for the world and certainly better for me if my system is adopted. Well, you have the essential foundation for a Cold War. Now, India, for example, is very interesting because we were a hybrid of two systems. We had uh, free elections. We have free elections. And uh, at the same time, we had a Soviet model of planning. We, had a, we set up a planning commission. We uh, very rigidly control the private sector. We, we wanted the commanding heights of the industri of industry to be in, the, in government control, in state control. All this was lifted directly from Gosplan, from the Soviet model. If you look at Vesenka, or you look at Gosplan, or you look at the other Soviet planning agencies of that particular period, it's very interesting to go through that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not just talking 1950s, I'm talking about the 30s, 40s, uh, 20s, when planning really began in the Soviet Union, was in the 20s, uh, under Lenin and then Stalin. And a lot of those elements were transposed to India because Jawaharlal Nehru believed that they were good for India. And so we had a kind of a hybrid model. And in terms of our diplomacy, well, for whatever reason, we were essentially, there's no question of being non aligned in a world of superpowers, frankly. Uh, you need protection of one or the other power or you're, you're finished off. So we had very effectively in the UN, etc., the protection of the Soviet Union. Uh, very definitely so. That was uh, formalized once in 1971, if I remember, the Indo-Soviet Treaty. The basis of that particular treaty was that Bangladesh situation was getting out of hand. 
India had to basically do something about it because of the genocide out there. The Chinese, the Pakistanis were deeply involved. The Chinese were being egged on by the Americans to get involved. I think if you track the diplomacy of those years, you will see that Kissinger was practically begging uh, Zhao Enlai to, uh, to send Chinese troops to help uh, Pakistan against India. The only way to block that was to have the Soviet Union firmly on your side. So a formal treaty was signed by the Soviet Union, and as a consequence, the Chinese huffed and puffed, but nothing more. Uh, and, the, and Pakistan was uh, completely, uh, I mean, uh, whatever. The only mistake we made was that we did not have a war crimes trial. Uh, at least uh, maybe 100 or 200, at least 20 of the war criminals of the Pakistan army should have been put on trial. Uh, the Bengalis wanted it. The Mukti Bahini wanted it. But for some reason, we allowed every one of them, including the war criminals, to escape to Pakistan. Anyway, and then we had a similar agreement after that. But what I'm trying to say is that we had a particular position in, in Cold War uh, 1.2. And very interestingly, the country that has become a superpower now, and I think Anand or you know, others who have been following my writing, etc. Uh, I mean, some of the writing is public, some of it is not so public, but the public writing also that I have defined China as superpower quite some time ago more than 15 years ago that this country is now arrived at superpower status. Now that country was very clear as to what it wanted. It wanted to be what you would call in Latin the tertius audience, which is the golden third party. And the golden third party is the party that benefits from a fight between party number one and party number two. So you have the first party and the second party, and the third party walks away with the cake. Uh, China wanted to be that tertius gardens and su significantly succeeded. It joined hands with the United States. In very many ways, it assisted the United States in Cold War 1.2 to, in a sense, take care of uh, the Soviet Union. It was very helpful in battling against the Soviet Union. And the United States lavished a tremendous amount of pressure and other things on China. And the Chinese also, if I may say so, followed a fairly sensible economic policy. I mean, if you look at 1980, you know, 81, 79, they invited foreign investment to come right into China in any, any in, you know, in a whole variety of sectors, 100% ownership. Now, at that point in time, their economy was far weaker than even our economy in that period. Forget about an economy now, it's way stronger than what China was in that period. The Chinese and the Americans had been enemies, they had fought wars against each other. The Korean War was, was an obvious example. They had fought the Korean War. In Vietnam, they had been fighting a proxy war uh, with the Americans. Despite that, they had a free entry to American investment into China. They have that self-confidence that we can handle this situation. Now, why I'm saying that is that sometimes in our country we have voices that say, oh my god, a new East India company is coming. If you have Amazon and Google and all that, that's going to be like a new East India company. They're going to swallow us up there, frankly. If China was not afraid of being swallowed up, I think we definitely, and it's very difficult to swallow up 1.3 billion people in any case. It's, uh, it's going to be a, quite a challenge. So I'm only pointing that out in terms of you know, the, re the ground realities and sometimes myths and perceptions as distinct from ground. Anyway, the Chinese took advantage of uh, Cold War 1.2. They understood the reality of Cold War 1.2. They took full advantage of it. And as a consequence, there was a period of extremely rapid growth in China, unprecedented in the whole world, with the result that today, the Chinese economy is about five times the size of the Indian economy. We are talking of an economy that in 79, when Deng Xiaoping began his reform, was weaker than the Indian economy of 1979. And today, the Chinese economy is five times bigger. Well, that is Cold War 1.2, and uh, for whatever reason, the Soviet Union imploded. I don't think it was, in, I mean, the Americans, 
It was almost entirely because the Soviet leadership itself that the Soviet Union imploded. The Americans were, if I may say so, an add-on. The real reason was the Soviet leadership and some of the errors they made, tactical errors, but more importantly, strategic errors. And if you make strategic errors, it has a pretty devastating effect on your long term. If you make tactical errors, it's a short term problem. If you make strategic errors, severe long term damage. And that finally caused the collapse of the USSR. Uh, 92, if I'm not mistaken. Am I right, Anand? I think 1992. 91. 91 and uh, beginning of 93. Yeah. So uh, at that point in time. So, so what I'm trying to say is that the Chinese were very focused on using the international order to leverage themselves up the ladder. Very focused on that. And they worked very clearly with whatever was needed to ensure that particular process. And they had a tacit alliance with the United States. It's a very interesting alliance. On record, they would abuse each other. And in practice, they would support each other. So, I mean, which I think is a, is a, was a pretty smart way for both sides to deal with. You attack, frankly, any normal person, I think it doesn't really matter what you tell publicly about me, so long as privately you're a resistance to me. And if you tell publicly lovely things about me, and privately you do harm to me, well, I think I'd much prefer that you abuse me publicly, but help me privately. I mean, whether you're a country or a society or an individual, or a company, I think that, that that's the lesson. So that is Cold War 1.4. Now, then what happens? The Soviet Union collapsed in 1992. Uh, sorry, the beginning of 1992, let's say 1991. It's more realistically 1991, because the actual implosion of Gorbachev getting out and all took place in, in that year. Uh, so then, what happened? The Chinese continued to be a very effective partner of the United States by making themselves indispensable in the logistics supply chain. So they, you know, their company, their uh, uh, economic development, their industrial development, and various other ways, they ensured that they formed a, an alternative logistics supply chain essentially with the goal in mind of finally replacing the United States as the, the, as the spinal cord of the world economy. Uh, that was public, publicly announced by Xi Jinping in his Belt and Road Initiative, 2013 if I'm not mistaken, in his Belt and Road Initiative, but it was, it was actually part of Chinese uh, strategy for a considerable period of time. I mean, we may think, for example, that uh, Americans and the Chinese got together in 79. Even as late as the, uh, the end of the 1950s, Chairman Mao used to talk in terms of swimming in the Mississippi River. Whenever an American used to come and say, I would like to swim in the Mississippi River. Now, the Chinese talk in a very electrical way. Uh, Americans talk in a fairly direct way. I don't know how Indians talk because, you know, I, I mean, we can't categorize ourselves yet. But the American interlocutors of the Chinese couldn't really understand what exactly they were pointing to. Mao was essentially saying, I want to do a deal with the Americans. I don't think Mao was very particular about swimming in the Mississippi, or which is probably a very polluted river, I don't know. I, 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 I think I may have seen the Mississippi River, I certainly will never go near it. But uh, that is what he meant. And finally, the hint was picked up by a gentleman called Richard Nixon. And Richard Nixon went ahead with the idea of, a, of an alignment with China, and that was established. So that was the situation at that point in time. After that, you saw the Chinese systematically built up their own value and supply chains, with the result that in substantial parts of the world, local logistics and supply chains were disrupted, and dependence on Chinese supply chains became immense. In India, for example, in, in some very important lines of manufacture, 70-80% of our critical supplies come from China, including some pretty important lines of manufacture. That way, if you look at defense, about 
nearly 80% of our critical defense needs, not 80%, it's about 65% now, come from the, the, the Russia, which is completely linked with China. The Russians and Chinese are into an alliance. So essentially, the Sino-Russian alliance, our defense is, is reliant on them. Our pharma is heavily reliant on material from them. Rare earths, everything else is also reliant on them. So they made themselves, in a sense, indispensable. American thought was fine. I mean, all right, you know, we, it was cheaper. We made more money out of it. Um, secondly, you flooded the world with cheap stuff, and which lasted as long as the, the craze was there. Because in the modern world today, you want to keep changing. So you want to keep changing what you buy as well. So if you have something that lasts for a long time, it's of very little value. You're certainly not, you know, I mean, your, your descendants are not going to welcome something that you hand over, unlike in the past where antiques had value, uh, mindsets are also changing with the digital age. So from that point of view, they built up this thing. But you had a situation in which, so long as, for example, Jiang Zemin was, was the uh, president of China, General Secretary of the Party, he was very content to use American technology. It was during the time of Hu Jintao that the Chinese decided that you know, almost everything that we are, all our tech is now based on foreign technology. We are Chinese. Why can't we develop our own tech? And when we develop our own tech means getting hold of our tech from wherever possible. And uh, I mean, I think open sources will tell you how they got their tech. A lot of it was done through their own scientists. Some of it was done in China. Some of it was done through, if I may say so, you know, access to technology by various means. The Chinese are the polar opposite of, Mao Zedong was the polar opposite of Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi said, ends and means. You know, ends don't mean anything. It's means that mean everything. And I, I don't care what the ends are. What is important is the means. For the Chinese, I can tell you, the means don't matter at all. It's only the ends. If you've got a particular objective, no matter how you reach it, you should reach it. In the case of Mahatma Gandhi, if you follow the right path, even if you know finally a partition and nothing much happens, it doesn't matter because you follow the right path. Now, morally speaking, that's a much better, uh, I mean, thing to have, and I think we can all be proud of the fact that we have a saintly individual like that who is the father of the nation. But the Chinese don't accept that kind of thinking; they have a totally different way of thinking. So. During Hu Jintao's time, the transformation took place. And by the last uh, you know, three or four years of his time, they started focusing on advanced tech, artificial intelligence, uh, space, uh, various other uh, you know, uh, computer systems, and various other things. I don't know if you're aware today that about more than 76% of online gaming is now controlled by China. I think in India, you're quite aware that about 70% of, uh, of our telecom equipment comes from China. A large part of the equipment for electrical, water, and other systems also comes from China. Uh, I think you must be quite aware of that. And in fact, some of the drones that are used even by the Indian armed forces come from China. Now, why this is important is that you can use these for remotely sucking up data. And when you're talking about artificial intelligence, essentially, artificial intelligence doesn't take very much of intelligence to run and to operate and to develop. It's, it doesn't take much. It, what it takes is masses of data, masses of metadata. India is a rich treasure trove of metadata. And with the help of the mobile telephony network being overwhelmingly uh, Chinese, with the help of so many of our other you know, switching and other systems being so overwhelmingly Chinese, a huge amount of data has been flowing to China for their AI systems every, every split second from India. And the problem here is that AI is a very significant component of warfare. So, uh, you know, in military, uh, in, in terms of, of warfare, etc., artificial intelligence is a very important component. 
So the Americans started making up by around, if I would say so, I would say the end of the 1990s, they started waking up to the reality that there is something going on, some kind of a, a transformation of China which is not really good for us because it's, we were always believing that we'll always be in control of tech. The Chinese are great people, but they, they're only at the secondary level. They can never reach that level. It's like Indians. We are body, we are body shopping people, our IT chaps. We can never be more than that, actually. We can, and we are. Many of the important uh, IT generating labs across the world, 30-40% uh, of, uh, of the personnel are either Indian Americans or Indian citizens. So it's only that in India we don't seem to be able to somehow uh, manage that particular thing. But so, so this is the situation that was facing the United States. And then you had a, you know, but who Hu Jintao was a very uh, recessed kind of person. He was not a very overt kind of person. He was very recessed. Like Deng Xiaoping, you know, speak softly, carry a big stick, but keep it hidden, speak very softly. And Hu Jintao, the stick was far away. He never wanted to come near the stick. He was very unmartial. And he gave a very, like Deng, a very friendly image of China. Jiang Zemin also gave a friendly image of China. And then suddenly you have Xi Jinping. And Xi Jinping has come at a time when China has become a declared superpower. So you have one of the conditions for a Cold War, which is that it has to be between two superpowers. You can't have a Cold War between a major power or a collection of major powers and a superpower. It's got to be two superpowers fighting each other or uh, competing with each other. So China became a superpower. The second thing where the, the, the necessary condition was met is that the Chinese now regard this also as a battle of systems. They regard their system as superior to the, I mean, I'm using the word shorthand American system because we're talking about the US PRC Cold War 2.0. But it's a system which is uh, much more common across the whole world. You can call it the liberal system, you can call it the conservative system, whatever it is, but it's not the communist system. It's not the, it's not the central planning system. It's not the, the control system which is followed uh, in, in the PRC. So they regard that system as being superior. And they, for the time Xi Jinping came, went in this Belt and Road Initiative, they've been fairly public about the fact that they would like to replace the United States at the top of the total pole. Now, some of us have been pointing this out some time ago, six, seven years ago, I started writing about the Chinese working on their own currency, strengthening their own currency. And in a sense, I made a prediction regarding uh, digital currency, blockchain, etc. Why blockchain? Because blockchain is transparent. In the, in, whether it's a bank or a currency, the more transparent you are, the monetary authorities are, the more confidence in the currency. You understand? Uh, it's also pretty accurate. So digital currency is again very flexible. So they started moving to the, the digital RMB. They started basing uh, their, their, their currency on blockchain. What was the intention? I will ask myself, but look, in my case, I look at the dollars. Uh, sometime back, we had some very bright students here. And they were discussing with me about this question of scientists dying. And I'd like to you know, give credit where it's due. And that is that we had a very interesting discussion for several hours on that. And they were pointing out various dots on the map, a kind of puzzle pieces of the jigsaw to me. And I went back, and I was thinking about the puzzle pieces that they were pointing out. And somehow it fell into place that there is an organized effort to kill Indian scientists. You understand? So from that point of view, finally the puzzle pieces came together that there is a very high probability that this is, represents an effort at. So then you inquire. You inquire with your sources uh, across the world, etc. And then you pick up bits and pieces of information, which convince me that two particular countries I'm not going to name them, but uh, you know, uh, they are both countries that are today very friendly with India, so I'm not going to name them at all. 
and, and I didn't name them then, I'm not going to name them now, and the sources told me never to name them. That is a condition of telling me that, and I think it's important to obey what your sources tell you if you need information. After that, the, the puzzle came into place, and I wrote a piece in Sunday Guardian about the, the deaths of Indian scientists, and that came out. And uh, very surprisingly, after that, the, the death stopped for, for uh, I mean, for nearly a decade. There were no deaths after that. Otherwise, there used to be two, three, four scientists, engineers dying, suicide, uh, accident, run over by a train, run over by cattle, got all kinds of things, all unsolved murders. Uh, depression, when the family was saying that I was a very cheerful chap. Suicide, when he had a good bank account, he had a good family, lovely relationship with his wife and family, good friends, didn't see any earthly reason for suicide. But nobody connected the dots, and they were connected by students of this particular department, frankly. They pointed out the dots to me. And I would never have come to that conclusion, but for these students who, uh, you know, who pointed out. I think at that point in time, Anand was around the same age as you chaps are now, second year or whatever. He's now mature. In fact, he possibly, uh, I mean, even before that period. But you know, what I'm trying to say is that you, if you connect the dots, I started connecting the dots of the Chinese, what Xi Jinping is trying to do to the Renminbi. And I came to the conclusion that the Chinese are looking at the reset of the US dollar. Why are they doing that? Because the US dollar is the global reserve currency. And when your currency is the global reserve currency, it's a very important method of establishing dominance over the economy and over geopolitics. You know, if I have the reserve currency, I'm a country, I have a vastly more power uh, than if I did not have the reserve currency. So clearly, the dots fell into place, and in my view, Xi Jinping was looking at a reset of the dollar, which means a 10, 20, 30% decline, crash in the value of the dollar at some future time. Now, of course, if you look at the uh, radio, I mean, RT, for example, Russian television, they're openly declaring the dollar's overvalued, dollar's overvalued, it's going to collapse, it's going to collapse. For some, for a long time they never said that, but now both sides are pretty clear. The dollar's overvalued and they all, and the Chinese are very clear, they want to replace the dollar with a basket where the renminbi is there. First there will be the renminbi, and then you have situations in which, for example, you have five or six, uh, you know, organisms in a basket. One organism kills everybody else, and finally, that's the only organism left behind. So you have a basket of five, six currencies. Eventually, it'll only be the renminbi. And the renminbi will replace the dollar as a reserve currency. So I wrote this uh, about that this is going to happen. I think about four, four and a half, five years ago. I don't exactly remember. So in this age of Google, you don't need to remember dates at all. And I've always been bad on dates. So then you have the Belt and Road Initiative. What is the point of the Belt and Road Initiative? I mean, I must say that, you know, right from the time I got interested in China and the United States, there are two countries I visited very regularly. One is China, one is the United States. And for some reason, somehow, I have a reasonable degree of access in both countries, with policy making levels, et cetera, et cetera. A reasonable degree of access. So I, I, when, I, when you talk to them, for example, sometimes a peace comes in view. Peace comes in view, peace comes in view. And then was the Belt and Road Initiative a way of resettling the Chinese diaspora across, uh, across the Belt and Road Initiative? Not really, because the Chinese don't really have a population problem. They have this one, one child policy. They have a pretty severe population problem in reverse. That is, they have far less young people than they need. And they certainly, I mean, exporting it. Exporting the population is really not a very great thing for them. So it can't be that. Then why are you talking in terms of spending this kind of money on this kind of a chain and reproducing this kind of a logistics chain? Obviously, because the Eurasian landmass is a single unit. Whether it's Europe or Asia. Today, if you look in terms of global trade, global commerce, Human uh, movements of, uh, of, of people, uh, you'll see that the Eurasian landmass is one landmass. 
the center of gravity of that landmass, the center of logistical chains of that landmass was always dominated by the United States. Through air, through shipping, not so much on rail and road. So what did the Chinese do? They went ahead with rail and road. Okay, the Americans are not there very big on rail, they're not very big on, on road inside Eurasia. So let's focus on that. And they have actually built alternative logistics and supply chains in which they are, it's, it ends in China. So you have financial markets, finally will end in China. You have logistics chains, supply logistics in manufacturing, etc., which will end in China. You have services chains ending in China because you've got Huawei, this, that, you know, I mean, all kinds of Chinese uh, uh, knowledge apps all over the place, conquering markets. So that will end in China. So essentially, it was a, it is the plan of basically supplanting the United States as the primary power of the world was pretty well advanced. It was no secret. And, uh, but how it was being done, step by step, their plan was becoming clear. Now, if it's been clear to me, it should be clear also to some, somebody in the United States, I would think. So obviously, they, it, I mean, you know, they, the Americans got the hint. And so from around the, uh, the, the fifth, uh, end of the fifth year, the sixth or seventh, the, the seventh and eighth years, if I may say so, of the Obama administration, they clearly understood that China is out to replace the United States at the top of the food chain. From that time, you had a real pivot to Asia and the Indo-Pacific. And let's not forget, when you talk about the Indo-Pacific, uh, if you look at American trade, it has at last you know, at the last count, if you check, I think it's about two times more important than a trade with Asia than trade with Europe. Even now, for a long time, trade with Asia has trumped trade with, uh, with, with Europe. So, whereas in the post Bretton Woods situation, the Atlantic was the key area, the center of gravity, today it's the Indo Pacific that is the center of gravity. So you have this very clear effort at establishing mastery over these different chains. And what is the purpose? The, you know, why are you building that kind of a navy? It's not to take on India, not even take on the American Navy, because frankly, it doesn't make sense. What it is really there is domination of the Indo-Pacific. And you have a Sino-Russian alliance. So through that, you have the Arctic move, etc., so you can move uh, you know, resources quickly from uh, Pacific to Atlantic. After the Indo-Pacific is taken over, you have privacy of the Atlantic. So essentially, first the challenge will come on the Indo-Pacific. They will win that challenge, move on to the Atlantic, win that challenge, and then really dominate space in a way even more comprehensive than what the Americans know. Americans dominated in terms of soft power also in a way the British never did. Chinese would like to dominate everything. And if I may, you know, uh, I mean, end this thing by saying, you are looking at game, at uh, this online game. What is the importance of online game? It teaches you human behavior. If you study online gaming through artificial intelligence uh, networks, you can track what makes people angry, different types. First of all, you can segment the population of different types of people. Then you can segment the hot buttons that make them angry or make them happy or whatever, whatever. Then you can start feeding social media those buttons. And the research that I have done and the kind of discussion that I have had, I am very convinced that the Sino Russian Alliance has taken a very active role in India and the United States in widening fault lines and ensuring that the right and left fringe. When I say right and left fringe, I don't mean political, I don't mean economic. I mean the two opposing sides, you know, become bigger and bigger at the expense of the moderate middle, which is reasonably friendly to both or open to both. So the middle is shrinking. Like the United States, the middle class is shrinking. The poor class is expanding hugely. The upper class actually is also shrinking, unfortunately. But it's an unstable society because a stable society where the middle expands and the fringes contract, fringes are expanding, and you have this very toxic messaging in social media. And uh, I mean, the 
case from my research, I am quite clear. A significant part of that is contributed by, uh, by control over certain narratives by entities controlled from outside India and the United States. A lot of concentration of effort is in India and the United States to expand these fault lines. Whether they are fault lines by region, fault lines by community, fault lines by religion, and the United States fault lines by color, whatever, whatever. Expanding the fault lines and making them more vicious to each other. And if you have this gaming theory, you can understand exactly how to make people angry. When you know how to make people happy, you also know how to make them angry. So it's a very deadly path and is there with these guys. So from all that point of view, I don't really like to say, today we are in a fact of life, we are in World War II. Now, frankly, I'm very clear as to what side we are on or should be on. That's the side, definitely not the side where China is. But the Chinese have made their choice. Their choice is in Pakistan. As far as Kashmir is concerned, they are now accepting the Pakistan case of Kashmir. I mean, the penny should have dropped during CPC, it did not drop for some of us. 2017, I started having a little bit of reconsideration, but 2019, significant reconsideration. Uh, but, it, you know, it took a long time for that penny to drop. But from the time CPC was announced, some of us should have got it. We didn't get it. We didn't get into the stop. So, frankly, the decision has been made for us. The Chinese don't want us as a partner. They want us as a subsidiary kind of thing. Uh, as a junior partner, the Pakistan is there. And Pakistan is defined as a country in opposition to India. So the country has defined itself in opposition. The idea of Pakistan is, I'm not India. You know? So in that situation, we have no choice but, in my view, going ahead with the American uh, system, the system where America is also there. It suits us also in terms of how we have to find nearly four and a half million uh, in our eyes there. We have large numbers of people coming and visiting. A lot of our tech, etc., is now done. But of course, the problem in India is that we are always a little behind the times in terms of our uh, strategic thinking. So, on the one hand, we say we want S400. On the other hand, we say we want this, we want that. Look, this is an age where if you don't take hard decisions, you're you're left with no good options. Hard decisions are a must to avoid hard times. And one problem in India, we always run away from hard decisions. And that is something that we are seeing even today. So, but I think we have, we have yet to take some hard decisions regarding Cold War 2.0. Chinese took very hard decisions on Cold War 1.0. They wrote that 1.0 Cold War. We, we take hard decisions in Cold War 2.0. We will write that and over a generation they are going to have very high rates of growth. But we need to take those decisions. And that's why the next three or four years is going to be very critical for this country. And that's why your role as geopolitical specialist is also going to be critical. So I just thought I would give you these, uh, these when I say so, this basket of thinking, because I'm perpetually looking for, for puzzle pieces. I'm per perpetually looking for, you know, the, sometimes for answers, sometimes the right questions. And I'm perpetually looking, looking for dots that can be connected so that you get an image at the end of that. So my, this is the way I've connected the dots. I talked about 2.2 for quite some time. It's now slowly becoming currency. Actually, if somebody has been tracking my writing, you'll see quite a lot of what I've been saying, including my public writing, has become widespread currency. Uh, I mean, 5, 10, 15 years later. At that point in time, nobody took it seriously, but and now and then the situation comes with people come and try to educate me on what I have myself written for 10 years. And I am very, very happy to be educated. I listen carefully and I thank them for giving me this information. So I am only saying, ladies and gentlemen, we are in 2.0 Cold War. We have the means to do what China did in Cold War 1.0. Be the tertius corners. For that we need smart policy. We need hard decisions. Bold moves, and if we have that, well, I think you guys are going to be, you know, very happy with, it, with your Indian passports. Very, very happy. Thank you. Questions? Uh, thank you, sir, for the very interesting talk. Uh, I'm Sneek, and I'm from the first year. So, uh, most all the points you like said were very interesting. 
But something that I would like to have some more clarification on is how you mentioned how technology and polarization is being used by the Chinese to kind of bring uh, fault lines between the Indian as well as American systems. So, if you take the other cases as well. So we do recognize that such kind of uh, things are going on. Uh, we do know that they are moving through technology, moving through artificial intelligence. But still we uh, heavily rely on uh, Chinese technology. We do not kind of, we, we are talking of Atmanarabhar Bharat and all those kind of initiatives. But still there is a heavy reliance on Chinese. While we have uh, talked of uh, moving off from China, like we are talking of taking our markets to Malaysia, Taiwan, and also some, sometimes bringing it to India. But still, there has not been a, uh, a, a bold move, as you told. So why is that lacking, and what can we do in the future? See, I'll tell you one problem that we have. That is, we don't understand the Chinese concept of warfare. Uh, the American concept of warfare is the standard concept of warfare, because we are so used to immersing ourselves in American and Western theory, which is a lot of guns, artillery, aircraft, ships, etc. The Chinese concept of warfare is very simply dominating the mind of the enemy and subduing the enemy through domination of the, of the mind and behavior of the enemy. For them, crippling uh, electric uh, power plant, let's say in Mumbai, that's warfare. For them, creating social tensions is warfare. For them, Blackening the reputation of, of a country outside is warfare. All this is warfare. So they have a very expansive concept of warfare. So the problem is that we may not recognize it as war. If we may think that the borders are quiet, so there's really no war. There's a the war, a Chinese concept of war is all pervasive. So we haven't understood that yet. So the result is that for the Chinese, the, their, tele, their, the mobile telephone they sell to us, the apps that they, that they have, and we have a lot of so-called Indian apps that are actually Chinese. Uh, a lot of Indian startups that are, I mean, actually controlled by Chinese. Th these are all instruments of warfare. So we don't understand that. So I think that understanding needs to come. Because I find Airtel, for example, is now relying heavily on Chinese equipment. Who are they? I mean, you know. Uh, Essentially, today it will go back as data, tomorrow it will come back as bullets. So that is that is a connection we have not made. I'll tell you why I was interested in this, and I think some people who are in this class, maybe I talked about this a long time ago, if you remember, about uh, oil, uh, you know, oil assets in, uh, in some parts of the world, Africa, etc. And in how Chinese companies would always bid a little more than the Indian company. So ONTC would bid $100 million, they would bid $103 million and get it. Now how is it that about 16, 17 bids that I studied, in almost all these bids, the, the bid was within one or two percent. How is that, except through hacking into our uh, systems and finding out what the bid was? Or, for example, in, you know, uh, let's say that Indian, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a tender in India. You have a World Bank tender, you've got all these world companies joined. You have an Indian company, it's bidding that, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll spend $50 million for it. The Chinese come and say, we'll spend $49.5 million. $0.5 million, $500,000. They get the contract. Now, how do they find that out? So I was very surprised about that, and I the obvious conclusion about they're hacking into you. Of course, this was many years ago, about 12, 13 years ago. Today, it's common knowledge as to what they're doing, but unfortunately, I still don't understand why we're not uh, fully comprehending that. I think part of the reason is that we really don't understand their concept of war. And this is, a, this is a problem that we face. It's what happened in Americans also. Today, you have the Biden administration. They're very happy to say, oh, this is a Republican issue. The, all this hate speech, this thing, that thing is all Republican. And the uh, Republicans are very happy to say, it's all Democrat. It's all this, uh, you know, your uh, what's called Antifa or, or BLM or things like that. They both blame each other. And as a consequence, the, the actual perpetrators of a lot of that uh, messaging, expert messaging, escape. So it's, it's a lack of awareness of the kind of war 
that we are engaged in. So completely different world from previous ones. Uh, thank you, sir. My name is Rahul, and uh, thank you for the talk. I very humbly agree with uh, the points that you raised in your talk today, and uh, I myself also ponder upon certain questions uh, regarding you know, the things that we talked about today. So one of the questions that comes to my mind very often is that how do we decide that it's time to pick now? Because then there are certain counter narratives as to we need uh, one of the largest economies, which is our neighbor as well, to support our economic growth or we do need the Russian missile systems, but then uh, there is also the narrative that we should pick a side when it's in the right time. And one of the second concerns that also keep coming to my mind is that how do we know if the side we pick is ready to hold us in their side and they are strong enough to be resilient towards um, you know, its adversaries. So that's something that comes across to my mind often and I would like you to clarify some things. Look, uh Look, frankly, uh, you know, you, uh, where the United States is concerned, where the Chinese are concerned, they have a deficit, I mean, we have a deficit of $60 billion with them. If you include switch trade and Hong Kong trade, it's probably more. Personally, we are losing $60 billion minimum per year to them. So I'm not entirely sure how much benefit we are getting. And a lot of items now you see Indian production has stopped, Indian jobs have stopped, and Chinese have got the jobs, and uh, that's having a terrible impact, even on handicrafts. You have certain communities in Uttar Pradesh, for example, who have been dealing in handicrafts for several hundreds of years. They are completely unemployed now because you have Chinese handicrafts. Indian handicrafts are all now Chinese handicrafts. They're made in China. You may write there, made in Muradabad or whatever, but it's actually made in China. So, frankly, I think the point is there is a strong lobby here which is making a lot of money from being the importers of Chinese goods and importing them to destroy Indian companies and Indian manufacturers. So that lobby is very good at its own narrative. So I think I'd only like to say that you know if you and I are you know are engaged in something and you're always taking money from me, I'm not entirely sure I'm getting from. Chinese are taking money from us. Whatever they're spending in Pakistan, spending on their military on the border, it's coming from as profit from India. So where that is so advantageous to India, I don't know. As for the Americans, they're transactional. Way back in, I think, when was this done shaker down? Uh, 91 or something? 91 or something, yeah. OK, what happened? There was an IMF loan. And, uh, they were refusing, IMF was basically refusing to give us a loan. We weren't very much. You remember Narasimha had an emergency kind of thing and he went with it. And you know. At that point in time, there's a chap called Sumarin Swami, who was a member of Parliament now. Swami was a commerce minister. He knows Americans very well. He knows the Chinese also very well. He knows the Israelis very well. He seems to know a lot of people very well, including the Pakistanis. But he went ahead and did a deal with the uh, George H.W. Bush administration. The deal was, we will allow Indian uh, American flights to refuel in India on their way to Iraq, and you uh, ensure IMF gives the loan. They agree. We got it. Everything is transactional. So in our case, if we assume that we are a wonderful people, we are saintly, we are the most moral country in the world, we would like the whole world to prosper. And so, because we are so good, you must help us. I'm sorry, nobody will help you. What is in it for them is the question. So in our case, for example, I mean, you know, we are not active anywhere outside South India. We're talking about terror, fighting terror. Outside India, we're not active at all in the war on terror. Not at all. Uh, so the question is transactional. I mean, what are you prepared to give? And then you get back. And if I may say so, uh, on this Galwan situation, uh, we paid a lot of very high prices. We got a lot of American equipment, smart missiles, uh, helicopters, huge transport aircraft. All that came in very, very handy. You understand? So and now I think you have American companies wanting to come into India and sell Lockheed, McDonnell Douglas, Raytheon, they all want to come and set up production in India, not because they like us, 
because they they know that if you produce part of your stuff in India, you can compete three, four years down the line with the Russians and the Chinese. Otherwise, in every market, American arms are going to be completely wiped out by cheaper and possibly as good Russian and Chinese arms. So they have to come to it. They want to come to it. You understand? But if they can't come if you have S4. So the question is the opportunity for them. My view is very clear. The Chinese have got S4. They know all the tricks of the trade. There are, from what I understand, Chinese, uh, I mean, embedded electronics in that. That's a very risky kind of thing. And more importantly, if you are with the Americans and you use the American system, well, that means the Pakistanis cannot move against us. For a simple reason, too many Pakistani generals have got condos in Miami and New York and San Francisco and London and all those condos are going to go up in smoke. They'll all be taken over like Gaddafi's was taken over or poor Bashar and other people have been taken over if they attack. So it's, a, it's an insurance against a Pakistan attack, not Chinese attack. Unfortunately, our way of looking at strategy is always very segmented and very side oriented. Air Force looks from what the Air Force needs. You have to come, if you look at a holistic point of view, then you look at it in a different way. So the question is looking at the 360 angle. If you look at a 90 degree angle, system A is the best. 360, system C is the best. 360, in my view, is the way we should look at it. You understand? Yes, sir. Thank you for your talk. Uh, quite quickly, two things. Uh, first question, uh, so you spoke a lot about uh, data and, and the US tech companies in particular, they may have built some of the best systems, best platforms uh, globally even today. But they're, very, they, they're extremely, um, especially the Silicon Valley majors, seem to be very uh, tied up with the question of privacy, uh, of privacy, of uh, data privacy, and of how much information they actually share with, with the state. Um, they would like as as far as possible a system close to zero regulations, and that's already been challenged across the world. Um, now in India, uh, actually before that in, in the US itself, there has been an uh, idea put forward, particularly with how the uh, the race uh, issues have been happening in the recent past. That for any uh, public any social media platform to sign in, you need to have uh, uh, an ID proof, uh, an identity proof that you provide. Um, now that's something which has been floated, hasn't moved anywhere. If, if a nation such as India, for example, were to take the lead for Indian citizens uh, using that platform uh, to, to actually do something like that, would it, how would you see such thing being received, particularly given the internal uh, right versus left fringe elements in, within India, which also you've spoken about, who also seem to have a big, a big fight going around on social media whenever you look at all these platforms. So that's, First, please, I'd just like to say that uh, you know, uh, people become very pro-freedom when they're in opposition. And when they're uh, in government, they become very pro-police. So I've seen this happen multiple times in the country. I think we are, the Indians are on the right track in demanding that we, uh, we have storing of data inside our country. I think that's very important. And whether it's Amazon or Google or whatever, they have to, they have to go by I mean, by domestic laws. So, certain amount of control will be inevitable. Uh, there's no question, but it has to be done. The Chinese have developed their own champions. And we can develop our own champions. So, I personally feel that a certain amount of regulation is going to happen. Because as you very correctly said, social media is a very potent means of creating fissures in society. And you, you declare yourself, what is wrong? No, I mean, uh, you have the same, uh, same, you know, you or me or whatever. We'll give up you. Doesn't matter. Let's do it. I personally feel there's no reason to be anonymous at all. You know, uh, I don't see any reason for that because uh, who is there to hide unless there's something, there's some agenda behind it. Uh, I mean, frankly, in the world of criminals, everything is anonymous. Everything is in the dark. I'm for transparency. I'm for light. So I, but at the same time, I'm for freedom of speech. Uh, when some chap called Kanaya Kumar was uh, uh, picked up in jail, I said, this is absolute rubbish. There's no point in picking him up. You made a hero out of him. You became a hero. Disha, that young lady, 
I wrote a piece in uh, Sunday Guardian that, you know, you guys have shot yourself in the foot. Everybody will now call India a Nazi state because you've gone and arrested this 21 year old girl. I mean, let her say what she wants to say. It doesn't matter. So long as she doesn't resort to violence or promote violence, I, I, mean, I read through that so called, there's nothing there. If this is a, you know, whatever, what is it called? A toolkit. I mean, it seems the, the if you're arresting for this toolkit, then I think, you know. So the point is very simple. Freedom of speech, yes. Tolerance of freedom of speech, yes. But in terms of declaring yourself an anonymity, my view is no. Uh, I, I don't think so. And that is not the, number one. Number two, I'll tell you, there is no anonymity. Let me be very frank with you. Whatever encrypted systems you do, at least three dozen agencies across the world will have will you break through that and get whatever you do. Not only that, they can plant stuff also, which you don't do. I mean, I don't want to talk about certain things in public, but I know on, on my laptop, for example, certain things have been planted, which, uh, I mean, which, were, you know, was not part of my browsing at all. Let's put it that way. I don't know how on earth they came in. They were planted. They were removed. They were again came in. And so thereafter, when I said, when I saw news reports about so and so being arrested and then in the computer, all kinds of very odd browsing habits, I started getting a little skeptical because I can assure you, I mean, you know, it's very easy to plan three or four, I mean, hours of this. So, and the most scary part is with a smartphone, you can find out exactly where you are at any point in time. I'll tell you an example of this. Uh, I have some friends of mine I mean, who are involved in various activities. Yeah. You know, I've known them for, for years. And so one chap, uh, we, we had a cup of tea, I think, at uh, Khan Market. I mean, I, we, my, I, I'm not part of a Khan Market gang, but I like Khan Market. There are some good, very good masala tea there. So we were having masala tea and he told me, Sir, you haven't had your walk today. Why didn't you take your walk? So. I was a bit surprised. How on earth did this guy know I don't take a walk? He suddenly hit me. My mobile phone. Through my mobile phone, the guy tracks my movements, where I am at any point in time. And he found that if my, I mean, obviously in my mobile, they probably confirmed that's how we found out. He, that, uh, he knew I, was, I hadn't taken my walk. Why didn't you walk in the mall today, sir? There's a big mall near our house. And huge mall. Because I'm just, I walk all the close to that mall. It's about four and a half, five, six kilometers. So I walk in that. So, I mean, you know, every thing of what you do is today trapped. So if you think you're going to be anonymous in any way, I'm sorry. Criminals can identify by paying hackers, big money. Agencies can identify it. I think, in, you know, in India also, our systems are pretty good. They're good in planting data. They're good in, in getting all of data. I don't know who on earth planted that stuff for me. It will not necessarily be from India, it can be from some other country as well. But uh, it was very amusing to, to find out my own uh, habits. Uh, you know, very amusing indeed. So I'd only like to say that uh, I'm sorry. Anonymity in data, forget it, number one. Get used to an area in which you are completely transparent. And live your life transparently. And, and I, I mean, in my view, what your, what your lifestyle is, what you eat, what you dress, what religion you believe in, it's your business. It's none of my business. And I think that, with the greater transparency, that is inevitably going to happen in society. Do you understand? So I'm sorry the age of privacy is a major. So, so from what you talked, something I gather is that uh, something you will be calling for is a fundamental change in Indian foreign policy. Because basically, we, uh, to some extent, or to a large extent, still function on how Nehru laid the uh, like foundation of Indian foreign policy. And we uh, refuse to take uh, like sides. So, and you have also called for like taking sides now. So, up to what extent and how will that affect India? Well, I advise you to wait till next year. There's a book of mine coming out called the 21st Century Foreign Policy for India. There are 10 books coming out. Sanjay Baru writing something on economics. Uh, 
Amitabh Khan is writing on administration. I, I was asked to write by, by the publishers of Modern Policy, so I finished the book I've sent him. So I'll, if you read all about it, what we need to do. But yes, I, I, frankly, I like our foreign policy. And let me say that, you know, Jay is doing an outstanding job. For example, Sri Lanka, Maldives, uh, Philippines, Vietnam, very quietly we are building up a chain of uh, security alliances. Very quiet. We are not advertising it, but we are doing it. So, uh, don't get me wrong, I think our foreign policy, vaccine diplomacy has been terrific. Uh, really very good. Uh, and as far as 2.0 is concerned, we may not admit it in public, but I think we are very clear as to what side we are on. We have a pretty hands-on Prime Minister, and I think you have a foreign minister who understands the Prime Minister well and responds to him. So, overall our foreign policy is doing pretty well. But at the same time, you know, we are still in a stage in which we like to promote a certain ambiguity about, about that. I personally feel that the age in which ambiguity is an advantage is now slowly, uh, is now slowly going away. In China, is, there is no ambiguity about China's stand on any issue, including Kashmir or India. Or no ambiguity. I think in our case also, I think we need to uh, be less ambiguous about that because again, and also be more transactional. What are we going to give? You know, how are we going to participate actively? And I leave one thought with you. That is that as, as, I, as I can calculate, nearly 40 million young people in just two states of Rupi and Bihar who are, you know, potentially very high value. I'll tell you why, because in our campus, for example, we have a large number of people from those states. They could not find the proper facility that they came here. They're among our best students. So the human material is fantastic. Now, if you don't give them jobs, tomorrow they may be on the roads, fighting on for religious grounds, fighting on caste grounds, other grounds. You know, uh, you have to make them, uh, you have to give them a sense of what the national mission is all about. It is why I've been talking about uh, you know, national service, uh, the expansion of NCC, things like that. Because you have to give them an idea of a, a national goal. So that they believe in it and they start working for it. Because if you don't know that there is a national goal, it's very easy to get taken in by, uh, by all kinds of movements. And I'm not going to categorize by any one party Almost everybody is equally innocent or guilty of that. So this nearly 40 million young people, they can either be amazingly good for our country or they can do enormous damage. Depends on how the next few years you look after them. You understand? So you know, we are, the next three, four years, in my view, are really critical as far as we are concerned. Are we going to you know, uh, repeat what China did? Or are we going to, you know, I mean, just do pretty badly? You understand? So that is exactly why the next three, four years is important. So, uh, Vasu, uh, thank you, sir. So, Vasu Sharma from of Masters will give a vote of thanks. Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, so, I would just like to sum up the whole session in highlighting important three to four points which were highlighted by Professor Nalukar. First of all, uh, uh, the position of India and China in World War 1.0 and how uh, China took advantage of its uh, of its position and it went uh, in a, and it went on a trajectory of unprecedented unprecedented growth. The so second, the session was really enriching in highlighting the pretext and context of what is this Cold War 2.0 which we are which you were talking about, and the importance of Chinese currency remain be the Belt and Road Initiative, and how the whole Cold War will has revolved and will revolve around supply chains, logistic chains, and service service chains ending in China. Also, one of the major points which sir highlighted was the sino russian cooperation, which is expanding the fault lines in US and India. And as well as now how the next three to four years will be most crucial and critical for India and the need 
for us to take hard decisions and bold moves which would decide our future. So, I, on behalf of the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, would like to thank Professor M.D. Nalapat, UNESCO Peace Chair and Director of DGIR Market. Sir, uh, thank you very much for providing such enriching, enriching session of, on Cold War 2.0 and inspiring all of us to further connect the dots and understand between the lines and dwell upon the topic much more. I would also like to thank, I would also like to thank the department for organizing this lecture and all the participants online and offline for asking the questions and making the discussion more enriching. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Excellent summary. Thank you, Asu.